Uh, Phil, let me start with you going to your area of expertise. What kind of pressure do you think we'll see from other OPEC producers for OPEC to cut production? Uh, we'll see pressure from other members of OPEC, but Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the UAE have embarked on a course of action uh, to essentially assure themselves a long-term market going out, uh, Naimi's talked out to 2050, and they're not going to do anything. So uh, it doesn't matter what Libya says. Uh, uh, it matters what Saudi Arabia says. And earlier this week, Naimi, uh, Naimi gave a very clear talk which said that the uh, Saudis would continue pushing towards 10 million barrels a day. They're at 9.8 now. And uh, they would continue uh, unless they got cooperation from a number of countries, not just OPEC countries, but, say, Canada, uh, Mexico, Norway, mm -hmm. and uh, although he didn't enumerate them. And none of that has been coming. So what the, uh, uh, the announcement of the agreement with Iran, assuming it all goes through, is that Iran will put more oil on the market and uh, prices will be even lower. Right. So... What, of course, you were speaking of Al Naimi, who is the oil minister of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Philip, what is Saudi Arabia's power to use oil as pressure of, to Iran when they're fighting in Yemen? Can Saudi Arabia weaponize oil when it comes to the Middle East? Well, in a sense that you can, any uh, commodity can be weaponized through the dollar by just continuing to produce 10 million barrels a day. Saudi Arabia will put further pressure on the price of oil. That will cut the Iranian income. Iran has already been hurt uh, by the decline in prices, and I don't think Iran can boost its production enough to offset the loss in income from the fall in prices. So mm -hmm. essentially, Saudi Arabia, like you say, is weaponizing oil. Mm -hmm. Hans, uh, I love to talk about oil. I love to get into it. Phil and I can go on for a long time. Does OPEC matter from where you sit? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, if, if you look at the emerging markets, a lot of the countries have you know a link to oil like, you know, Venezuela Ecuador Russia mm -hmm. so it's part of the analysis that we need to do if we're gonna make an investment in one of those places um, on the other hand I mean I I guess my my trader is dead he just follows oil like it's a religion I'm a little bit more but you know we've seen some volatility but it's in a certain price range and I don't want to overreact to the Iran Accord because I think people have been seeing it coming for a while. Mm -hmm. And for the time it'll take to actually get it online, I'm, I'm not, who knows what's going to happen to prices. Um, and that Saudi is going to be using it as a weapon. Well, they'll probably use anything they can against Iran, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of uh, Iran and sort of the, the, the deal here, Iranian companies are trying to buy a Swiss petroleum refinery, and that's according to the Wall Street Journal, citing people familiar with the deal. And this really struck me because it seemed that Iran's already preparing to do business outside, at, acting as if sanctions will be lifted. Phil, what did you make of this? Well, uh, I, I look at this, and, I, and my question is why? Uh, uh, that, that refinery in Switzerland is a money loser. And as is almost all the refining capacity in Europe, given what the expansion of the capacity in the Middle East. Uh, I think that the much more important move by Iran is to go to China and look at increasing sales to China. Uh, they're competing directly with Saudi Arabia there. And uh, if uh, an agreement comes through, even if the U.S. maintains sanctions, if the U.N. sanctions are lifted, uh, the Chinese will no doubt rush to buy more Iranian oil getting an even better deal from Iran than they get from Saudi Arabia and uh, so, so that the Iranians will be selling their crude and monetizing their crude. Uh, you know, if they do buy that Swiss refinery, it's going to be with borrowed money and it's going to be an almost meaningless transaction. Hmm, meaningless transaction, but Hans, what would you, you made a good case last time to talk about the opportunities of Iran. What do you need to see to want to put money into the country? Obviously, sanctions lifted mm -hmm. would help. Um, I you know, it'd be interesting just to meet with some of the people uh, around. I'm sure that some of them will be coming to the IMF World Bank meeting, so I'd like to talk to them and see um, the preliminary conversations I've had with some Ar Iranian government representatives here in this country. It's incredible how they're reaching out to look for investments. I mean, they, you know, they're looking forward two, three years already. So um, my sense is that they're going to be very inviting to investors. American investors, mm -hmm. and they're probably looking to open the market. I'm sure that there's a level of technocrats underneath the Ayatollahs who really want to engage with the international community. So 
I, I would expect that, I mean, even with oil, they're going to be able to go into the regular markets and engage in a, in a transparent way. So things should be much smoother, and you'd think that there's probably, I mean, just on equities, I mean, there's probably going to be a real rush in it, as long as things are normal. Right, we definitely see sort of European oil companies kind of waiting, chomping at the bit there. Uh,